What's up, everybody? Oh, welcome into our first look here at a new case that so many of you have asked me about in a lot of the lives, and that is the sheriff who shot the judge. What's going on in that case? What is he charged with? Are they moving forward? What evidence do they have against him? What are some reasons or potential motives behind this? Well, today was the preliminary hearing, which is one of the first big parts of a case. And so many of you have asked for my breakdowns on it, and I really just didn't know what all I could add to the table if there was no legal proceedings that have taken place, no legal arguments being made. Well, that changed today. So we've got something to talk about in this case, and it's maybe more interesting than it initially seemed. So we're going to watch the entirety of the preliminary hearing and see if the judge finds that there is probable cause for the state to continue forward. So before we jump into this preliminary hearing, I'll just let you know, I didn't know anything about this case outside of sheriff walks in to judge's chamber and shoots judge. Uh, I don't know what evidence they had. I didn't know what the background was. I don't know what the reasoning for it was. Um, it was shocking and horrifying that something like this could happen, especially from two public servants who have probably known each other in the community. It seems like, you know, they were familiar with each other. They were at luncheons together, things like that. While some very vague information comes out in this hearing that may give us an indication of what the motive is, or at least that there's definitely more that we're going to find out, but they called the lead investigator here to the stand. He's the only witness in this preliminary hearing. And then we're going to hear some arguments from the lawyers at the end. Um, and, and specifically in this situation, you'll see that there's a video. They're not saying he didn't do it. They're not saying this was not the guy, but they're definitely picking apart around the edges as in, should this be first degree? Should this be a premeditated, intentional crime? Or are there other elements here that maybe it should be something lesser? Are they going to try to work some deal? Is this something that's going to go to trial? It's very interesting just straight from the jump here with the preliminary hearing to see how the defense lawyers um, pick apart this particular part of the proceedings. And if this is your first video with us, welcome. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you like this video. Uh, but a preliminary hearing is basically just for a judge to determine, is there a probable cause to move forward on the charge that the state has chosen? Different states allow lesser included on these charges, but at this point, they have to just provide enough. This is not going to be all the evidence we see at trial. This is just enough evidence for the judge to say, okay, they've got the guy over there. They've got enough evidence, not necessarily to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. He's still presumed innocent, but is there enough for probable cause? And he's being held. So there's obviously enough here that the judge thinks he should be held um, in jail waiting for these proceedings to continue. But will they have enough evidence to produce this judge to be able to go forward and potentially go to trial on a first-degree murder charge? That's what this hearing is about, and that's what we're going to focus on listening to today and see if they meet that burden as the state. I'm sorry. How are you, I'm a detective with the Kentucky State Police assigned post-13 hazard. How long have you been in? All right, we'll slow it down a little. It's got, we got some Kentucky accents, which is nice. We'll slow it down a little. Before that crisis. Uh, I've been with KSP a little over 24 years. Uh, detective since 2006. And have you, uh, in the form of the detective police, have you investigated the death of uh, Kevin Mullins? Yes, sir, I did. And can you tell us on what date that was? It was uh, September 19th, 2024. Uh, an investigation of that death. So just a few days ago, literally, this just happened a few days ago, and everybody's been asking for comments from me. And I, again, I don't like to speculate or guess or just react to a video. Sometimes it does happen, and sometimes I do do that. Um, but I wanted to wait in this case to see what happens legally. Is he just going to plead? Is he going to admit what he did? What's going, that still could happen. But now that there's a preliminary hearing, there's a lot more information we're going to hear here. Were you able to determine who killed Kevin Mullins? Yes. And how were you able to do that? Uh, video surveillance footage. And did you retrieve that video surveillance footage? I did. You know, at this time, what did it come from? Did you play video footage? All right. All right. Yes, approach the bench. So the defense objects, which is interesting. Uh, but if there's video surveillance footage, obviously the judge is going to review it. And if there's video surveillance footage, usually that is exactly the type of evidence that would make it an open and shut case, quote unquote, open and shut. And in this case, law enforcement had the video footage. That's how they figured out who did it. They know who this guy is, obviously, if he's the sheriff, because that's what he is. He ended up stepping down. Um, some people say it's because the governor threatened to remove him from office, but he ends up stepping down so he's no longer the sheriff. But at the time, he's the sheriff, and this guy's a judge. So my guess is most of the parties involved, law enforcement, judges, lawyers, prosecutors, public defenders, other cops, they're all going to know who these two people are. 
So what kind of conflicts? Who's going to be doing the investigation? I think he said he's Kentucky State Police. So you get it. And we learned a lot about that in the Karen Reed case. State police versus local sheriff's officer, local cops. So this is a sheriff being investigated by the state police. But it's not like they don't know each other. It's not like they're still not some kind of blue line, potentially. Um, also, as most people know, cops don't usually do well in jail. So there's all sorts of different things going on here as we kind of watch this unfold. But the video evidence is always the best evidence. And that's what they have in this case. And that's what the state wants to present to the judge and the public here, because this is a public hearing. Other times you're going to hear in this hearing that the lawyers don't want to discuss certain things publicly, but this video is public. I'm going to skip the sidebar. The judge, by the way, overruled their objection, is going to allow the video to play. And you're going to see in this video, which I can just set it up for you, he stands up, pulls his firearm, fires multiple times while the judge is trying to hide under his desk, hide under the wall. There's no sound on it, but even as the sheriff is walking out, the judge is still moving and he makes sure to fire another one. So there's no doubt the intent at the time he starts pulling the trigger, right? There's no doubt that he's intending to harm him or take his life, probably take his life, frankly, uh, because if he was just trying to harm him, he did that. He could have left with just harming him. So there's no real argument against that once you see this video, but the motivations behind it, was it premeditated even for... You know, premeditation is a big thing. People always want to know, um, does it have to be for days? Does it have to be for weeks planning this out? And that's not necessarily what premeditation is. It can be a shorter period of time. There's no specific time requirement for it to be premeditation. But for this to be an intentional premeditated crime in order to get to first degree, that could be different than he snapped or something happened. The judge said something, the officer saw something and he snapped and that's why he pulled his fire. So that could be potentially second degree or even manslaughter of different kinds, um, depending on the state and their laws and the lesser included. And specifically how it works in Kentucky is there is a top murder charge that throughout this video I'll call first degree. And then there's a first degree manslaughter and second degree manslaughter charge. The first degree manslaughter charge is kind of the one we're going to be focusing on that I think the defense might want. And again, throughout this video, I'm going to call it second degree murder or manslaughter again, because different states use different terminology, but it's basically a lesser charge to the murder charge that you can get to. And specifically Kentucky has an interesting defense we're going to look at really quick that could bring something from being the top first degree charge to a lesser manslaughter charge. And that is called the extreme emotional disturbance. So uh, this is the 507030 statute. This is the manslaughter statute in Kentucky. A person is guilty of manslaughter in the first degree when, with intent to cause serious physical injury to another person, he or she causes the death of such person or of a third person. With the intent to cause the death of another person, he or she causes the death of such person or of a third person under circumstances which do not constitute murder because he or she acts under the influence of extreme emotional disturbance as defined in subsection 1507020. Okay. So it would be the top charge if not for an extreme emotional disturbance. So again, that's exactly like a crime of passion, committing something in the heat of passion. Something causes you to snap and boom, you do it. It's not insanity. It's not not guilty. You don't go home free. It's just a lesser charge than the top first degree charge. So again, throughout this video, we're going to continue to discuss it. Was there a snap? Was there a heat of passion? Was there something that caused him to snap? And if there was, what was it? And again, the terminology we're going to use throughout is you know, first degree, the top charge, first degree M, whatever it may be. And then to get it reduced down to something less, which is really what I think the defense is after, and they're even going to argue it, is that manslaughter. You know, again, I may say something like second degree or whatever, but I'm talking about dropping it down one level, specifically how Kentucky does it, which lots of states have different insanity laws or mens rea, meaning your criminal mental state. Did you have a criminal mental state at the time? And there are different ways to attack it and argue it as a defense attorney to get something lesser included than that top charge. Because again, that top charge carries with it the top penalties um, and all the seriousness that comes with it. So as we watch through this together, and as we're going to hear the defense attorney's questions together, make sure you keep that in mind. Um, as we're breaking down exactly what happened, exactly what may have set the sheriff off, because the defense attorneys are going to do a lot more than just hint that something happened here to set him off. And they're even going to use the video of the crime itself as evidence to help them try to prove 
that is not the top first degree type charge. So this might not just be the cops not guilty of anything. They could argue this is just too harsh and too high of a level of a crime that he's been charged with in this scenario. And it's not right to allow them to go forward on this because again, the harsher crime you're charged with, the worse penalty, the harder it is to make a deal because if you're looking at life or the death penalty versus 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, it all is leverage when lawyers are negotiating deals. So all of this stuff matters. It also matters with potential bail, depending on the crime, how harsh of a crime you're charged with, if you have any other prior crimes. All of this stuff is important to get it right. Now, usually state attorneys charge the highest crime they think they can win beyond a reasonable doubt. Sometimes we agree with that, sometimes we don't. But it's not unusual for them to charge the highest crime, even if we're like, eh, I'm not so sure that's where it's going to end up. So now we're going to watch the video. If you guys want to skip it, this is your PSA. On second thought, we're going to clip out that video. Um, it's not necessary for the legal analysis at this point in this case for us to watch it. It may become more relevant when we actually get to the trial, if we ever get there. And we can talk about breaking down the video in more detail if it was a self-defense type of a situation, but it's not. Um, it is more execution style, if anything, where the sheriff stands up, points his firearm at the judge and pulls the trigger multiple times before on his way out firing again to make sure that the job is done. Um, so I, I didn't think we really needed to re-watch it in its entirety here. So we decided to clip it out. <laughs> and you can see him right there with his hand up, the judge with his hand up, like, whoa, 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 what are you doing kind of thing. And obviously people distraught in the gallery. No doubt about that. Brutal to watch. Horribly brutal to watch. And no way, in my opinion, this guy gets off, right? With that kind of evidence, he's presumed innocent and we're going to give him all the benefits of the doubt we give every criminal defendant. But when you see evidence like that, if that evidence comes in, which I don't really see a legal reason why it wouldn't, I don't see how this guy doesn't get convicted of something. But that doesn't mean it's going to be the first degree murder charge. And that's what we're here to kind of discuss and break down. And a lot of your charges have been, or a lot of your questions have been, is this first degree, is it second degree, is it manslaughter of some sort? And I didn't really know why you were asking. Maybe you knew more about it than I did. And we're going to get more of those details throughout the rest of this hearing. Okay, that was uh, Sheriff Mickey Steins and Judge Kevin Mullins. And also, you who had the firearm? Uh, Sheriff Steins. And then uh, Judge was also in his black robe. Yes. Do you know what large portion of the courthouse that is? That is the judge's chambers. And where's that located at, physically located? In the Letcher County Courthouse. So I'll have you on. Would you like to cross examine the witness? I would, Your Honor. That was a short clip that was played there. How, how long do you believe that clip was? That we just watched? Yes, sir. Just 10 seconds, 15 seconds? Yeah, 15 seconds. Uh, in fact, the video that was taken in the judge's chambers between the meeting between Sheriff Steins and Judge Mullins, um, it's my understanding that that video lasted much longer, correct? Yes. So sorry, you may not have noticed it because it was so quick. Prosecutor was done. That's it. It's all they needed. It's all the evidence you need to get over probable cause. Frankly, it might be enough evidence to get over beyond a reasonable doubt. Not really because of the other elements of first degree. But for these proceedings, now you guys know what it looks like when you have a video of a crime just like this, showing the entirety of the crime on that video. That's all a prosecutor needs really to get over probable cause from a judge. But now the defense lawyer is up there cross-examining, trying to poke holes, trying to nibble around the edges and really fight mostly against first degree. And maybe that it should be something lesser than that. And by the way, that's the defendant sitting over there, the bigger guy with the beard and the glasses. Sheriff Mickey Steins is his name. Okay. And have you had an opportunity to review the video uh -huh. of the prior? And this is the defense lawyer. And he's saying there's a lot more to the video than those 10 seconds, right? And by the way, everything I'm hearing watching this for the first time, I'm like, oh, oh, is there more? What? Oh, what's this mean? What's it? I'm trying to read into everything almost, which you really shouldn't do. But a lot of questions and answers are brought up here. Prior incident. Uh -huh. And can you describe for us what happened immediately prior to the clip that we saw? Uh. Sheriff Steins is, uses his telephone to make some phone calls. He then borrows Judge Mullen's cell phone and appears to make a call on that. And that led to what you just saw. Okay. So it's my understanding there were um, 
some people who were having a meeting with Judge Mullins prior to his the sheriff's entry into the chambers. Is that correct? Yes. Have you identified those witnesses? Uh, I don't know the names of them. There's about approximately four people in there. Then uh, Sheriff Steins enters the judge's chambers and everybody else clears out. You don't know their names? Not right off, no. Have you prepared to... So there were other people in there before. Sheriff comes in, they leave. It's interesting. And all those people are going to be witnesses at trial, you would think. But they don't need to bring him here today, which is one of the differences between a preliminary hearing and a trial, right? You don't need everything at a preliminary hearing as the state. A, a report? Uh, in, not, in the process, yes. You're in the process of preparing a report? Yes, a lot of information. But you've not spoken to any of those witnesses? I'm not directly, but they've all been interviewed. There's recorded interviews of those people in the case. Okay, so um, other officers have spoken with those four witnesses? Yes. And what is your understanding of what those four witnesses have said? I, I don't recall. You have no idea what they said? No. I don't think that's great. He probably should have listened to it. He should, probably should have been able to testify to it. I don't think that's really fair to the defense. It's kind of blocking them from getting some information. Um, but again, preliminary hearing, the bar is a lot lower. There, I want to make sure I understand. Had there been a hearing previously this day in chambers? In the, in the courtroom? No, in chambers. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And so there's a video camera that is running in the district judge's chambers. Is that on all the time? It's my understanding, yes. And have you spoken with anyone about why that may be? No. I mean, there's cameras throughout the courthouse. Well, fair enough. But um, are you familiar with district judges' chambers normally, how they're set up? No, I mean, some of them have video surveillance and some don't. Right, but this one does. generally when they have surveillance, you agree with me that that is utilized when there is a proceeding going on in change, correct? It could be, yes. Okay. Um, and I'm just asking, so this video didn't have an audio recording to it, correct? No, there's no audio. Outside of the, once the four people that were inside that we don't know their names, once these four people had left uh, the chambers, um, were they in an area adjacent where they could hear anything that was going on? Yes, I believe some of them did remain in the next room. Okay. And what did they tell us? Do what? What did they hear? Uh, I've not been part. I wasn't part of those interviews. Okay. So if I'm understanding. So it's very clear the defense attorney is trying to get out what was going on, build the context, build the scene, who was saying what, was anybody screaming, was anybody yelling at each other, what set this off, what created this issue, who was saying what, they were just in the room, they were just outside the room, they had to hear something, but this guy's like, I haven't watched the interviews, I didn't do the interview, I don't know what they said, I don't know what they heard. So not a lot of information coming, but it seems like the defense attorney, because again, he's got his defendant there telling him what happened, who was there, so he should know some of this, and there's usually reasons behind these questions, and we don't get a lot of answers. Hey, Craig, you're prepared for a uh, preliminary hearing on the murder, and there are witnesses in an adjacent room. I mean, they, they heard gunshots. Can I put my question, please? Yeah, please, 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 please. Thank you, Oscar. So you are investigating a murder and testifying in a preliminary hearing, and there are witnesses who may have overheard what preceded this edited clip. Yet you can't tell us today anything that they said? I've not personally listened to those interviews. I've talked to the other officers that did those interviews. Fair enough. I mean, we're here at preliminary hearing. As you know, you can you can testify to hearsay. I'm asking you what they said. They heard gunshots. Okay. Was there any statements that they overheard? No. So he does know some stuff they overheard. Were there raised voices? There one one person stated that she heard she didn't recognize him as, as being Judge Mullen's voice, but heard somebody say, Help, help. Mm. Presumably, that will be after the firearm was drawn or shot. Objection, I, I will draw, a Judge. Withdraw. Okay. So, is there any testimony that you can give us today about any statements or arguments or the content of that argument prior to the shoot? No. Yeah. Um, I want to ask generally. Uh, so, did you process the scene? Uh, are, are you the lead investigator on this case? I am. Okay, so as a lead investigator, I would presume that you would have secured the chambers and evidence once you arrived. I was I was part of that, yes. You were part of it, right? But you were the lead investigator, so you'd be in charge of those duties and 
delegating what should be done. Is that no, fair? No, I don't delegate what's done. Okay, so you're the lead investigator. What does that mean? I'm the case officer. Okay, so you're carrying the case. So I want to make sure I understand. Um, was had uh, Judge Mullins been removed from Chambers when you arrived? No. Um, were you able to ascertain? Did he have a firearm on his person? We did not locate one. You did not locate one? No, there was not one in the Chambers. Okay, and there was none on his person. No. Okay. All right. Who, who was the first person to arrive on behalf of law enforcement to investigate? They were already in the courthouse. Fair enough, but I'm talking about in terms of people that we may see a report from. Or it's very unusual, right, for the courthouse to be the scene of a crime. Although we've seen a couple with the judge jumper and now this, but they're already all right there. They hear gunshots, people start yelling. I mean, I don't know how far he got. I don't know anything about it. I don't know if he got out of the building because people knew who he was. If they ever assumed it was him once he holstered his firearm, they didn't think it was weird that he had a firearm in there. Normal average Joes can't bring their firearms in there. Even if you have a carry concealed, can't bring it into the courthouse. Um, so, I mean, I don't really know what happened in the aftermath. Honestly, this is everything I'm learning basically about this case is coming from this here. Take part in this investigation. Who, who would be the first person? Uh, I believe Trooper Jason Bates was the first KSP personnel on the scene. And you spoke with him and he, I did. And he searched and did not locate a firearm. No, he didn't search the scene. No, you, you his, just, his role. Sure. His role at that point was security of the scene. I understand, but I'm just trying to answer for you to say that there was a firearm found. No. I'm wanting that to know, did you, or you, can you tell us, was it specifically search for a firearm? In the judge's chambers? That's, yes, sir. There was uh, myself, Detective Chris Collins, Detective Scott Caldwell, uh, Detective Eric Caldwell. That's all I recall right now. The, okay, but I'm trying to say, did, so who searched specifically for a fire? We all did. And that was specifically something you looked for? Yes. Fair enough. Okay. Of course, your investigation, did you ascertain that prior in the day, there had been a lunch meeting between Sheriff Stein and Judge Mullen? There was. Pardon? There was. Okay. Sorry. I, I couldn't hear your response. I wasn't being trite. Um, so who was, where was this, where did this take place? It's a restaurant called Streetside, and it's uh -huh. just down the street from the courthouse. Okay. And as my understanding, there were a couple of other people who attended the luncheon. There were several, yes. Okay. And at some point after that, they, they wrapped up lunch, uh, and left obviously and went back to the courthouse. Um, are you aware of anything so far in your investigation that would tell us there was any, there was any issues at lunch between judge? No. All and share sign. No. So I did, and again, maybe I lied when I said all I know is what's in here. There have been some tweets and stuff that people have tagged me in talking about arguments or the sheriff got mad. He says there's no evidence that there was an argument or any problem at the luncheon that happened prior to this interaction in Chambers. Okay. But someone on behalf of the KSP has spoken to those witnesses? Yes, they were, they've all been interviewed. And there was nothing unusual that had arisen during that luncheon? I was told that the judge made a statement to Mickey about, do we need to meet private in my chambers? That's all I was told. Do you know the context of I do what not. the conversation was before that they would need to discuss in chambers? I do not. That sounds like there maybe was an issue, right? First he said there was no issue. Now it's like, well, yeah, the judge said, do we need to meet privately in my chambers? So it's my understanding that in the larger portion of the video that we haven't uh, had access to, that there is a point when Sheriff Steins asked for um, to see the telephone of Judge Mullins. All right. So now we get to an interesting back and forth. And the sheriff asks for the judge's phone at some point when they're in the room together. And this is where we start to potentially get to some of the legal arguments that maybe it's not first degree. Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, I would presume that uh, you and the other officers you mentioned when you uh, secured the scene that you secured those phones as well. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, have you reviewed both of those phones? Uh, they're currently at the forensic lab at this time being downloaded. I have had discussions with uh, the people at the lab regarding the downloads. And those are a couple of other questions that I was going to ask you, but my original question was, have you reviewed or are you aware of the content of the phones? I've not 
personally seen it because I've not received those reports yet. Okay, again, based on your conversations with the officers, are you aware of any recent content that was up and could have been relevant at the time of their discussion? Uh, I was told that uh, Sheriff Stein had tried to call his daughter and he had tried to call his daughter from the judge's phone also. So, so that to me, very strange. Steins tried to call his daughter, the defendant, and he tried to call the daughter from the judge's phone. Why would he do that? I have no idea. I don't want to speculate, but you're going to hear the defense attorney now ask, does it seem like right after the phone stuff happened again, because there's no audio on this video recording and there's only one person alive now to tell us what happened inside that room. So again, if we're looking forward to the trial, that may or may not ever happen. Who's going to be able to testify and tell us what happened in the room? Not the judge only the defendant. So what happened with the phones? Because the defense lawyer is trying to say, whatever happened in that phones, boom, heat of passion, potentially second degree instead of first degree or even manslaughter. But I would say their best bet is probably second degree. Depraved heart. Like you walk in on your spouse with somebody in different states, different arguments can be made between manslaughter and second degree. But it seems like that's what the defense is getting at. That's something that happened with the phones and these phone calls, which now we hear involved the sheriff's daughter. We don't know how her phone number got in the judge's phone. She could have, I don't know how old the daughter is either, clerked for him, knew him, friends with his daughter. I have no idea. Don't want to speculate. But what I will say is it's clear the defense is trying to point out that whatever happened on that phone sparked the sheriff to pull his weapon. Um, have, you had, have you obtained the phone records from Judge Mullins' phone? I don't have those in my possession yet. No. Have you uh, issued a search yeah, warrant for yeah, them? Yes. Okay. And uh, have officers confirmed that the sheriff's daughter's phone number was on Judge Mullins' phone? Yes. Okay. So, yes. so that number had been called from Judge Mullins' phone. Yes. That's correct? Yes. Okay. We don't know how it got there. Saw tweets that the sheriff put it on there. I have no idea. They can figure out when a phone number is entered into a phone. So we should be able to find that out. But as he says multiple times throughout this, they don't have the full cell phone download yet. So we don't have a viewing of what transpired during that exchange of phones. But based upon your review of those moments prior to, when Sheriff Steins observes that cell phone, is it a, was he previously seated? Yes. Okay, so in the clip we saw he's standing the entire time. He was seated in front of the judge's desk. And he looks at the cell phone. What is it? Can you describe his reaction in the video that we haven't seen? Who's your reaction? Oh, the sheriff. You can't see his face in the video. Okay. But is it clear that, does it appear to you that, oh, let, me let me rephrase this. Did he stand up after yes. looking at the phone? He stood up. And how long after he looked at the cell phone and stood up did this occur that you play? Just seconds. Did you make the decision as uh, on edits today for, for what you were going to present? Do in terms I, of, did you make the edit or determine no, which I, portion of the video we were going to see today? No, sir, I did not. Both cell phones have been sent to the Kentucky State Police Forensic yes. team, is that correct? Yes. Have you gotten any early report on what was found? No. What was? It's really interesting, right? So you don't even have to have all the information, enough information to really fight this preliminary hearing because if you have enough to get it over probable cause, then, well, I mean, what if, again... The reason is you have this video. What's the phone going to say that's going to give this guy an excuse to do this? He was not in fear. He was not in danger. If this guy was doing something deplorable, this judge, you arrest him. You call the cops. You don't do what this sheriff did. So if anything, it's going to play to motive or maybe a lesser included charge. But based on what the video is, the judge has to make a decision based on the evidence presented. Is there enough there? to allow the state to continue forward on the first degree murder charge. Were both phones still on the desk when you uh, arrived? The, the judge's phone was on the desk. Uh, Sheriff Stein's phone was on his person. Okay. 
So um, are there photographs all, was the phone locked at that point or was it still open? With both of you asking about both of them or? For, well, first let's talk about, that's fair. First I'm talking about Judge Mullins' since it was the one that was still on the desk and presumably nobody touched it prior to you securing it, correct? No, no. So yeah, so I would like to know about that. Have you ascertained what was currently open on that cell phone? No, I, I don't know at this point, no. You don't know? No. Do you think that would be, do you think that would be important to learn? Uh, I hope to learn that when the report's ready, yes. Okay. Um, but as of today, you can't tell us no. what was currently open on the judge's phone? No, sir. Did you conduct an interview with Sheriff Stein's daughter? I did not, but she has been interviewed. Are you aware of any, who was present when she was interviewed? Uh, Lieutenant Randy Combs and Detective Anthony Trotter. Okay. She's interviewed with or without her parent? Uh, with. So her parent was present at the time you interviewed her? Yes, I believe. I wasn't there, but yes, I think so. Law enforcement has not spoken to her without the parent present? Not that I'm aware of. Um, did the Texas State Police uh, obtain her phone? No. Do you intend to obtain records for her cell phone number? Possibly, yes. Do you believe that that would be soon that you'll do that? And some state prosecutors would object like, this is a discovery that he's acting like this is a discovery deposition, which a lot of defense lawyers use it as, and some judges will cut you off and not allow it because you know what they're going to do in the future in their investigation doesn't necessarily affect the probable cause. Maybe you could argue it does, but probably doesn't when you have a video of it in this situation, but it's definitely something you should do. And if this was a trial and he was trying to act like this guy didn't do an investigation, these are great questions in front of a jury to hit his competency. Um, but that's not what this is at a preliminary hearing really. So while we're all thinking, of course you should, it's only been, you know, two weeks since this happened and they're actively working it, but that's the difference here. Again, that I keep highlighting between a preliminary hearing and trial. Uh, could be, yes. Had you already intended to do that or did you just respond to my question? Well, the, the call should be on the judge's records too. Well, I understand. And she's made statements about what occurred during those conversations. I understand that, but I would presume that are you, have you ascertained whether judge. So they know what the daughter says occurred during those discussions and they have the judge's phone, but he's asking, are they going to download the daughter's phone? We've also had apps that stand outside all phone records. I've not received those records yet. I don't know what's on the phone. Fair enough. But, I mean, did you look at the phone? Did it appear there were apps on it? I, I'm not the person that's qualified to look through the phone. Okay, but you, you're familiar with cell phones. They can host other forms of communication. What suggestion? He's asked a question about four or five different ways the officers can take it. He said he doesn't have a report phone. He's not looking for phone. He can't testify that night. I should let him ask a question and that way he can only testify what he, what he has personal knowledge about. Actually, yes, sir. Thank you. Right. So you're aware that phones can be, be used for apps such as Facebook? Yes. Okay. And that is not something that is captured by cell phone records. Do you agree with me? I agree. Some of them can, some of them can't. But um, so again, to me, it feels a little sinister that there are apps. He may be communicating with people like the sheriff's daughter owns. Definitely the defense trying to paint some kind of picture, in my opinion. I don't think I'm making this up in my head. You guys can let me know if I don't or if you have more information in the background. I don't. But what I'm garnering from this is defense is saying something on the cell phone triggered Stein involving his daughter communications with the judge potentially. And that's why he pulls his firearm on the judge. That's what it seems like to me. So in light of that, although the records may be mutually the same, right? The same between judge Mullins's phone and the sheriff's daughter. Do you believe that she could also ascertain other information from the cell phone app content? Are you asking what apps are on the phone? Yes. Well, that was my I, original question. I don't I know about, I've not received that report yet. I don't know what apps he had downloaded on the phone. If he has social media apps, do you intend to? That could lead to additional search warrants, yes. If you would, also please let me finish before you move forward. And I'll try to slow down a little bit as well, okay? Sure. Thank you. Have you determined whether there were any previous uh, 
issues, personal or professional, between sheriff's signs and judge Lawrence? I've heard things. What have you heard? Uh, just that of this regarding the lawsuit that the Lecture County Sheriff's Office is currently involved with. So there have been previous issues between the sheriff and the judge. He's heard things about with previous lawsuits. The details are unknown to me at this time. The lawsuit that involved um, ultimately a criminal conviction of a deputy for sexual behavior in the judge's chambers. Is that the one you're referring to? Yes. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Some sexual behavior in the judge's chambers. I don't know if he means this judge. It, the subject matter of that lawsuit, um, the chambers area, that's the same chambers in which this occurred. Is that correct? I'm not familiar with the details of that case that the lawsuit resulted from. Okay. Um, are you aware of any criminal uh, reports that Sheriff Steins have made of Judge Mullins prior to this day? No. So again, he says no, but the lawyer's asking the question for a reason. Are you aware of any prior criminal complaints the sheriff has made against the judge in the past? Um, did you personally observe Sheriff Steins uh, following the, this video? Did that person observe him once? Did you meet with him? Did you talk to him after? He was in custody when I arrived at the courthouse that afternoon. Uh, and at, at some point, did you uh, draw any observation about his demeanor? He was uh, mostly calm, I thought. I mean, I, I talked to him, but not. he didn't say nothing about why this had happened, but he was uh, calm. He was uh, kind of afraid that, uh, basically all he said was, treat me fair. That's that's basically the comments he made. Okay. Um, did he also make a statement about, I didn't see it in the citation here, somewhere along the line I saw a statement being attributed to him about protecting his family. He was, I wasn't present, but when he, uh, when he was taken into custody, I was told by one of the other officers that were there that he made the comment, they're trying to kidnap my wife and kid. They're trying to kidnap my wife and kid? Who? Who is trying to kidnap his wife and kid? This is where I was like, what? Is there way more going on in this case than seems to have met the eye at this point? Maybe you guys can set, shed some light. Maybe I'm way off base with the other stuff I thought the defense attorney was trying to point out because that is not where I saw this going. Like, I have no idea now. This seems like opening Pandora's box with this case at this point. Uh, have you ascertained any evidence that this uh, shooting uh, was pre-planned? No, not at this time. Uh, and would you agree? So there's nothing that showed that this shooting was pre-planned. Now, again, pre-planned and premeditation are two different things, but it's a good question by the defense attorney. That from what we've seen so far, from the evidence you've seen so far, the shooting was a reaction to what was on that cell phone in that moment. Is that accurate? Yes, Your Honor. All speculation outside of still still permitted Your Honor, I believe that if he is forming an opinion about the investigation up to this point, especially at a preliminary hearing, he can speculate. Uh, oh, there's a statement. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> is there anything other than the content of the phone um, that this video will reveal to us about why this took place? No. Um, does it appear that this um, took place as a reaction to what was happening in the chambers at that point? I can say it occurred after a phone call was made. I don't know what was said or nothing like that. But. But fair enough, but I'm not asking. So it was after a phone call was made. He doesn't know what was said. I'll back it up so we can hear that again. But pre-planned and premeditated may have similar definitions. But legally speaking, when you talk about pre-planned, 
it seems like a higher burden than premeditation, I'll just tell you. Because throughout the case law, most times it's just thinking about beforehand for a few moments or a short time or doing anything to plan, like holding up your firearm and talking to him for a minute before you do this. It was not an instant immediate reaction. There's all sorts of arguments about that that we can get into potentially as we learn more about exactly what happened leading up to the shooting. To what was happening in the chamber today. I can say it occurred after a phone call was made. I don't know what was said or nothing like that. But. But fair enough, but I'm not asking you the content of any of that. But at this point, um, is it your theory that whatever that content was in the discussion was the impetus of the shooting? That could be, but I don't. I don't know that for a fact. Okay. Um, do you have any evidence up until this point that you have developed that would demonstrate that it was not? as a reaction to what was on the phone? No. None whatsoever? No. Okay. So he has no evidence to point that it was not from what happened on the phone. Which if I had just one moment to control. Uh, did you attempt to speak to Sheriff Steins at the Leslie County Jail after the incident? No. Did anyone from uh, your agency attempt to interview him? Not to my knowledge, no. And at that point, had he asserted his right to an attorney or anything? No. And nobody went back to try to talk to him or do an interview? No. That's curious, isn't it? He asked to be treated fairly. They didn't go try to get a confession out of him or anything like that. A, maybe they knew there was a video. B, maybe they just knew he wouldn't talk to him because he's a cop and he knows all, how's all, how all that stuff works. But I find that to be a little curious. Um, I think I have one other question. In addition to, to cell phones that we discussed, the cell phone of Sheriff Steins and the cell phone that you found of those ones, were there additional phones that you were able to obtain? There was one other phone that's currently being examined. And the basic reason it was seized was there was a text conversation between uh, Sheriff Steins and some of his... Uh, employees with the sheriff's office. Okay, and that was an additional phone of Sheriff Steins? It was a phone of, I guess she's the, uh, I don't know what her title is, but she's employed. She's not sworn. She's employed by the Ledger County Sheriff's Office. And she voluntarily gave her phone to the person that interviewed her. Okay, and just out of, curi just out of curiosity, what, did you explain why that was relevant or germane to your investigation? I didn't conduct that interview, but it was, uh, I guess it was regarding the dinner at Streetside and things that led up to uh, to the shooting, but I don't have those results either, so I don't know exactly what was said. Correct me if I'm wrong. I thought when we discussed that earlier that you indicated there was no evidence that the conversations at the launch. I haven't seen. I haven't seen those conversations yet. I've not received the downloads from the phone. Right. But I ask you if you're aware of any information could have been gleaned from witnesses at that meeting. And as I recall, you said, no, but there is some information that something was discussed at this lunch. Is that correct? I don't know what was discussed at lunch. I understand, but you obtained this uh, lady that we don't know her name. You obtained her phone in an effort or based on a belief that she would be able to demonstrate what was said at lunch. So you would agree with me. You believe that there is a witness or information that may have popped up at lunch. There's a recorded interview with her in the case, and I'm yet to receive the downloads of the phone, so I don't know what they contain. Okay. Well, right. Has that phone been sent to the it forensic is. examination as well? Yes. All right. Thank you. Also, it's all happy. Thank you. Rep. Has Judge Mullins been sent to Medical General Boston Office? He was. Have you received that report yet? No. Have you had a So, again, this is now redirect states back up, asked if. The judge has been sent for an autopsy, yes, but he hasn't gotten the report back yet. Any form of conversation came regarding his cause of death? Yes. And what was that? Multiple gunshot wounds. And, um, and just talking about the elements, you do have to prove that the person passed from the actions of the defendant. And if it wasn't clear enough in the video, they have confirmation there that even though we don't have the report, multiple gunshot wounds is how he passed. The video we showed earlier had a true and accurate copy, clip copy of what you received. Yes. Hopefully there is comes in one year. Right, I'd ask uh, the, uh, 
Uh, of course, all we saw today was the clip, but I ask it be admitted in its entirety. You want to respond to that? Good job. I think the preliminary hearing required for stop calls this is after stop call. I think the entire clip is outside the purview of the other. Please, yeah, I think you want to want to see the whole video. You should have objected earlier. I'll, I'll admit the uh, the short clip. Yeah, I have the clerk enter that as a judge number one. The state just said it would be overkill to put the whole clip in. Judge, this is just a preliminary hearing. Judge agrees and just admits the clip. This is, a, this is an ongoing investigation. Hey, detective, this is a, this is an ongoing investigation. Yes, it is. And as this ongoing investigation uh, proceeds, you will be. Uh, I'll see interviewing more people if necessary, submitting more evidence to the lab. Yes. That's all I have. Recross. All right. Any other witnesses for the Commonwealth? No, 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 no. All right. You may stay. We're not allowed to sum up. Anything else before we turn to court? Yeah, sure. There's no, uh, we're not allowed to sum up, Judge. What, uh, oh, if you want to make an argument, sure. But it sounds like you, <laughs> you I, mean, I may change your mind. Judge. It is a probable cause hearing, so, but yes. Actually, take, take your best. Judge is like, this thing's over. Oh, you want to make an argument, defense attorney? Uh, I apologize. Go ahead. Sorry, I thought we were all done. The defense attorney's like, maybe I'll change my, my argument, Judge. But here we go. I think everybody knows where this one's going as far as what the judge's ruling is going to be. But let's hear the defense's argument nonetheless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, uh, Murder under air session, as the court knows, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but if there is an issue as to extreme emotional disturbance, then there has to be some evidence that would rebut that. And uh, specifically, when I asked the witness today if there was any evidence to rebut that that this occurred as a direct result in the moment of this observation, we finally have none. This, and I give it's just probable cause, but I think they've established probable cause for manslaughter first, but not murder. So even he says that they've established probable cause for manslaughter, but not first degree. And that's interesting. And while he's not going to win the argument here today, spoiler alert, I think in the future in front of a jury, maybe that is a winning argument. Or maybe more importantly, it's a winning argument later with the state, which is why the state charges first. Because then if he says, please take manslaughter and they can come to an agreement on second degree, it's all about leverage. Like I said, in lawyers negotiating some kind of plea deal, they all think it's fair and that the client will accept. But even he's admitting now there's probable cause. Again, probable cause is very different than beyond a reasonable doubt and being guilty. But they're wanting to point it at manslaughter. The state's wanting to point it at first degree based on the facts that they both know. I've got heard nothing that indicates that this is not uh, you know, an example of a, an extreme emotional disturbance relative to the following. Uh, any rate, Judge, respectfully, I understand the court's previous ruling, but I do want, I did want to address that. No, that's fine. Let the Thank you, come up respond. Thank you, Your Honor. Trevor Marshall's is a defense. There's not been a defense presented here at this court today. Uh, the evidence presented this court today is that um, the judge was intentionally shot and killed, shot multiple times by the sheriff, and there's probable cause to obviously bring him murder charge. Yeah, I agree. There, there's probable cause to proceed with murder. Sure. All right. Uh, anything else before we adjourn court today? Your Honor, um, in terms of uh, We'd like to discuss if we could uh, lodging uh, from here where he's transported. Is it the court's intention to have him take? And I don't want to discuss that potentially publicly, Your Honor. Um, um, I'm not sure I can make that help you on that. Sure. sure. So I mean, we could. You're, you're welcome, welcome to stay at court and discuss that. I'm not sure I can tell the. Sure. So the transport order that was entered that will direct uh, uh, Sheriff Simon to go back to where he came from, Judge. Is that? Let's fair. let's just let's adjourn court and we'll talk about that. Yes, I don't know that I can change where he's going to be at. Actually, yes, yes, we can discuss. All right. Thank you. All right. What's your all right. So he says there's enough for first degree, and I keep calling it first degree because that's where it is. That's what it is in Florida. In Kentucky, it's a little bit different. There is murder. There's first degree manslaughter. There's second degree manslaughter, and you know I kind of think that first degree manslaughter is somewhere between second degree murder and manslaughter in some other states. But the point is the state's going for the top charge, which, you know, in my mind is always first degree murder. It's just called murder there, I think. And then they have a first degree manslaughter, which is more of a response, heat of passion, depraved heart, mix of second degree and invol or involuntary manslaughter in other states like Florida. So again, the defense seems to be pointing to the manslaughter. The state seems to be pointing to the murder. We'll see what ends up going forward. If any deals are made, if any of that leverage is used, um, and if this continues to push forward for trial, but at this point, judge says there's enough to continue forward on murder and those will be the charges the state's going to go forward on. Um, so let me know your thoughts. Let me know your thoughts about, you know, there being a video, how you think this one goes forward, what you think the fights are going to be about. And if this ends up being something that ends in a plea deal, which would be my guest at this point. Um, but we'll kind of see how it all works itself out. Thank you guys for joining me. Hit that like button if you have not already and make sure you are subscribed to our page. 
Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.